Hey, welcome to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for stopping by. Our prayer today is that God would speak to your heart and he would change your life as you listen to this message. So sit back, open up your heart, your mind, and your ears, and let God speak to you today. I want you to get your Bible, turn to John chapter 1. We're going to... We're going to try to answer um, a question that I think is a difficult question to answer because when we ask it, we feel so, as believers, asking this question makes us feel, uh, we're asking it from a very dark place and we feel bad for even asking it, but we have to ask it sometimes. And the question is, are you the one? This is the question that John the Baptist asked Jesus on the darkest days of his life. Jesus, are you the one? Um, and isn't it strange how that you can know Jesus? I mean, I'm, I, 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 we've got a, a, a room of people here who you know Jesus. Wave at me if you know Jesus. You walk with Jesus. You know him. You hear his voice. You sense his presence. You know when you pray, you know he answers you. But isn't it strange how that, that you can go from one season in your life where that you're just sensing the presence of the Lord and, and, and you, man, I mean, you're just on fire for God. Uh, you sense his presence. You sense his anointing. You know he's answering your prayer. And you go from just knowing that he's real. You know that he's God. You know that he is the creator of all things. And you just have this tight uh, relationship going with him where that you're just sure, you're just sure. You go from that to the next day wondering if he even is alive, if he even really exists. And then when you get to that place, you say to yourself, how did this happen? I mean, yesterday I was so sure. Yesterday I was so on fire for God, and yet here today I'm like, I don't even know if God's real. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know you're here, and I know you're watching, and I know, you're that, I know you are hearing one way or another, and something resonates in your spirit to say, yes, I have been in that place, or perhaps, man, I'm in that place right now. In fact, there might be some people in this room right now who are only here because it's Sunday. I mean you fought it. You had a great excuse. You had a really good excuse today not to come. You said, man, the weather's bad, the roads are bad. But I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go not because I really want to. I'm not going because I'm really excited about it. I'm going to go just because it's what I do. It's Sunday. I don't feel anything. I don't expect anything. I don't really know anything. But I'm going to go because it's Sunday. Now, I'm not asking for your hand, but I'll tell you right now. I know you're here. Either here today or, you've, or you have experienced that. And if you haven't, that you will. Even those super spiritual giants among us who, who, who think they will never have that kind of a day. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. So you need to understand that you're not the first to experience this kind of inner turmoil. It's been going on a long time. John Chapter 1, verse 29, interesting passage of scripture. Talks about John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. So I take you there to verse 29. It says, the next day, John, this is before it happened. Uh, the, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one I told you about. When I said someone else will come, he's greater than I am because he was alive before I was even born. And then he makes this statement, verse 31, that, that I'm going to use this term, bum puzzles me. Because this is, remember who's talking now, it's John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, I didn't know who he was. But I came to baptize you with water so that everyone in Israel would see him. And I was there, and I saw the Spirit come down on him like a dove from heaven, and the Spirit stayed on him. But before this, I didn't even know who he was. There he says it the second time. But the one who sent me 
to baptize with water told me, you will see the Spirit come down and stay on someone. And then you'll know that he's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen, John the Baptist says. I tell you, he is the Son of God. Now, there's a lot going on in what I just read. I go back to the statement that he makes twice when he says, I didn't even know if he was the one. And I, I read that this week and I almost held my head. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus. They're six months apart in age. When Mary found out she was pregnant, she went to see her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist. Remember? And even before John the Baptist was born, while he's in the womb of his mother, as soon as Mary comes in and she begins to have this conversation, the scripture said the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped. He knew before he was born. Before either one of them were born. John already knew who that was. But he says in this passage, I didn't know who he was until... Didn't know who he was. Now, growing up, I understand distances. I understand that things are not like they are today. And people would have traveled far distances to see each other. Going to see your cousin uh, for Mary to go to see Elizabeth probably was a big deal. They probably didn't get together all the time. They weren't talking on the phone. They, They weren't having those kind of conversations. But I have to think, I mean, I have to assume, I step away from the passage to say, this is just me talking, but there's a part of me that's like, surely growing up, They had some kind of a connection. Surely growing up, you know the story about Jesus being at the temple when he's 12 years old and everybody went together and and they and they're three, they're they're in the journey on their way home and they realize Jesus isn't with them. They have to go back and they find him and he's he's visiting with the teachers, he's speaking with the teachers, he's he's listening to the teachers, and he's he's even expounding with the teachers in the temple. And and they say, Where were you at? And he says, Well, you knew where I'd be. I'd be about my father's men. Surely that got around the family. Surely that's not just Mary and Joseph that know about that. I'm sure the word finally, you know, you know, how, you know how people talk even without a phone. Surely Elizabeth had a, got, had a caught wind of, you ought to hear what Jesus did. He's down there. Because that's not normal. Twelve-year-olds letting the family leave them so that they can stay and discuss the word of God with teachers is not a normal thing. So you have this whole life. 30 years, 30 years, John and Jesus both entering into ministry. John's baptizing, preaching about someone that's going to follow him that will baptize not just with water but with the Holy Spirit. And you find them here then saying, before I baptized him, he said, I saw Jesus coming. I saw him coming. We had this discourse about you know, Jesus, I can't baptize you, remember? You ever read about that? Jesus, I can't be, you, I sh- I'm not worthy, you should be baptizing me. Having this conversation with this guy that he's about to baptize, but he's saying, before I baptized, I didn't even know who he was. What are you talking about, John? You just argued with the guy about, I should be baptizing you, you shouldn't be baptized. What, what do you, what do you? But he say it's not until you baptize him and he comes up and the spirit lands on him. The, 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 the spirit in the form of the dove lands on him. And at that point you realize this is the son of God. This is the one that the messenger that came to me has been telling me all this time when I saw that I would know. Didn't know before? All those things didn't add up before? You missed it up to now? But at least... I don't know what's going on, but at least at this point, the light comes on. And John said, when I did and I saw the Spirit, I knew then. And then he says, I was for sure. I was completely for sure at that moment that he really was the Messiah. So I said, okay, well, John, I'm I'm baffled that you didn't know it before. But I'm sure I wouldn't. I'm not that intelligent, but I'm, but, but I'm not John the Baptist. But okay, I, I'm walking with you. But at least at some point, you reach a place in your life where that you are completely, 100%, he is the one. 
So surely, John, with me still? Surely, John, after this, after all this, surely, John, that is at least, if nothing else, that is at least forever settled in your mind. He is who he said he was, right? Hmm. And they both go their separate ways. John continues to point people to Jesus. Jesus, what's Jesus do? He goes out into the wilderness. He's, he's led out by the Spirit, driven out by the Spirit in the wilderness. And he's out there and he's tempted. Remember, for 40 days, 40 nights, and all the temptations come. Then it, this is preparation for Jesus. So John's still baptizing. Jesus is out there being tempted. Jesus passes all the temptations, comes back into town, and starts rounding up disciples. And he starts doing his ministry. And both guys are doing their thing. John's over here baptizing. Jesus over here discipling, bringing in new disciples, and doing, they're all doing their thing. And then Jesus actually begins to baptize, although it's, the scripture said it wasn't really Jesus, it was his disciples, but the word gets around that, that Jesus' gang is actually baptizing more folks than John's. So they've got this going on now. Of course, all of the religious leaders are upset with both of them, hate them both, because they're leading people away from them to God, and so they're, they're all really uh, upset about this. But both of them go about their ministries until John gets put in a bad spot in Mark chapter 6, verse 17. It said that Herod had earlier married Herodias, the wife of his brother, Philip. Now that's messed up. I don't care where you're from. I'm not even going to name states. That's still messed up. You don't marry your mama. You don't marry your sisters. You don't marry your children. You don't marry your sisters-in-law or your mother's-in-law. You don't do all that. But he did. And John told him, it isn't right for you to take your brother's wife. So in order to please Herodias, Herod arrested John and put him in prison. So here we go. Jesus continues on. Now John is sitting in prison. And then it happened. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Let's talk about that for a minute. John the Baptist was really John the human being. John the Baptist was really John the normal guy. The regular person. No, John was a superhero. It was like John the Baptist, Superman, and Batman. Nope. John the Baptist was just a guy named John who got a nickname of being a Baptist because he baptized folks. He was on the right track. He understands truth. He knows Jesus is coming. He preaches truth, points people to Jesus, doing what any of us would do. And in the midst of it, he's baptizing folks, and he gets this nickname of the Baptist, John the Baptist. But he's not anything special. He's a regular human being, just like us. He's just doing what God called him to do. So John... The normal, John the regular, John the human being is sitting in prison and Jesus, meanwhile, is having revival. And John is hearing about it. Man, Jesus is out there. They're having revival. They're baptizing people. They're doing miracles. Everywhere he's going, there's huge crowds. Jesus is a rock star. And I am sitting in a dark prison cell. Guess what? That'll work on a normal person's mind after a while. Won't it? How come I'm sitting in here? I was doing the same thing. I was trying to point him to him. I, and you'd think that I, you know, I, I don't get it. You would think that this would be my, my most pivotal moment this would be my time. And yet, I'm sitting in a dark, dingy dungeon. And they're out there breaking off fish and loaves. I mean, they're having a party. You know how we can get sometimes. Somebody else, something going good for them is not for you. And all of a sudden, you, you, you realize you're talking bad about them. You didn't know you were. 
Here I am over here, can't pay my bills, and such and such over there's got a big race. I've been at church every Sunday this month. They've missed two out of the last four, and there they are. They've got a big race. Huh? Got them, got them a new house. And all of a sudden, he starts thinking about things like, am I ever going to be free again? Am I ever going to get out of here? Is this it? Is this the way my life is going to end in this mess? What did I do? All I did was, all I did was tell the truth. All I did was what I had to do that was in my spirit. And th- Is this the way it's going to end? Am I never going to hear from God again? Am I never going to baptize another person? Uh, is this it? My ministry over? And the darkness and... The loneliness and the discouragement and the depression of this season of his life, they begin to weigh on his mind and his body and even on his soul. And then it happens, the unthinkable. You'd never expect this out of John. It's unquestionable. It's unthinkable. But it happens. He begins to question what he was 100% sure of before can anybody relate to that you knew 100% you left an altar service one time and you told everybody the whole next week man if I ever had any questions they're done for, for good now God answered my prayer. God touched me. God spoke to my heart. I mean, he, he gave me specific words. He gave me a scripture. If I ever doubted it, I never will. I never will again. And then you find yourself one day saying, is he really real? Because I haven't heard from him in a while. So he sent some of his disciples to ask cousin Jesus a question. How's it come to the place that he would ask this question. Yet here it comes. Matthew 11 and 2. John was in prison when he heard what Christ was doing. So John sent some of his followers to ask Jesus. Are you the one we should be looking for? Or must we wait for someone else? And I don't think I'm reading that the way he said it. Because in the state of mind. I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. I may find out someday I was completely wrong. That he was sweet and happy and kind. And he was like ask Jesus. But I got a feeling it was different than that. I've got a feeling it was a bit of anger and disappointment. Depression in his voice. Hey, go ask him if he's really the one. Or do we need to wait on somebody else because he ain't doing nothing for me. Go find out. Do I need to wait on somebody else because this ain't working. Hmm. And Jesus' response, is Jesus angry? Well, how would you feel? Is Jesus angry? Is he hurt? Is he disappointed? Is he ready to write John off as a lost cause? Well, maybe we would be, right? Somebody questions your, somebody, I'm telling you, somebody questions your character. I've had that happen before. Has anybody here ever had that happen with somebody questioning you, you, you really, you're trying to do right and you had somebody question your character? Like, he ain't all that. He stands up there in front of everybody and runs his mouth every Sunday. But that sucker, he just a, he's a dog. You know, you ever had anybody do you like that? So Jesus, what's he going to say? How's he going to respond to this? I love, I love John, the, the John chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. I want you to hear this. This is what it says. Because of all that the Son is, we have been given one blessing after another. The law was given by Moses, but Jesus brought us, here it is, undeserved kindness and truth. How many people in this room have said, I've been a recipient of undeserved kindness and truth from Jesus? I have. I'm going to wave my, I'm going to get my, I can't get the other foot up, but I'm going to get them all up. I have been on more occasions than, than I have digits to count. That's our Jesus, that's our Savior, that's our good God. 
So G- Jesus replies, he sends back a messenger to John through the messengers, the messengers that come, John, he sends back a message. It's in uh, Matthew 11, verse 4, Jesus answered, he said, go tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind are now able to see. The lame can walk. People with leprosy are being healed. The deaf can hear. The dead are being raised to life. The poor are hearing the good news. So his answer is, yes, I am, and there's the proof. But there's more. He says in verse 6, And God will bless everyone who doesn't reject me because of what I do. Now, you got to understand something about that, about that word, reject. Because you need to understand what Jesus was saying. The word reject there means, um, this is a person who will not hit against or stumble over some obstacle or thing that they may meet with in the way. Did you get that? Do I need to say it again? I'll read it in, I'll read it in the verse. God will bless everyone who does not hit against or stumble over some obstacle or thing that they might meet with in the way because of what I do. So the answer was, yes, I am who I said I was, number one. But number two, yeah, John, I am who I am, I am who I said I am, but don't let this situation trip you up. That's what he's saying. Answer number one, yes. Number two, don't, don't. Stumble up, trip up, reject, fall, quit, hang on. And then the third thing that Jesus said is not even in that verse. The third thing Jesus says, and I want you to hear this, happens after the messengers leave to go tell John the first two. Ooh, it would have been so cool if John could have heard number three. It'd be so cool if you could hear number three. But many times you don't get to hear what Jesus thinks about you. If he could have just heard it. So he's going to have to believe it in faith. Because Jesus says in 11, 11, I tell you, this is after the messengers leave. They're gone. He's watching them walk off to go tell. They're, they're leaving to tell John the first two answers, right? And as they're leaving, Jesus looks at the rest of the folks who are there and he says, I'm going to tell you all something. No one ever born on this earth is greater than John the Baptist. Now, he said, whoever's least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. But nobody's ever been Wow. Now, John wasn't feeling that way about himself, was he? Had somebody asked John that day, what do you think Jesus say about you? Well, he'd probably say I'm a disappointment. He'd probably say I'm, a, I'm, you know, that I'm angry and I got bad attitude. He'd probably say that, that I'm not doing right. That's what he'd probably say. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said there's never, ever, there's never been a person born greater than him. He's the greatest. In my estimation, Jesus said, John the Baptist is the best. Wow, wouldn't it have been cool if he'd have said that before the messengers left so that when they got there, they could have told John. The messengers don't hear that part. They just tell John, he is who he said he was. Proof is in the miracles. He said, if you don't get tripped up. But everybody else heard He's also the greatest. Wouldn't it be cool if you could hear what Jesus thinks about you and you say, no, because it might not be good. I'm telling you it would. I'm telling you this is an applicable word to somebody today. Later on, James would write in James chapter 1, verse 12, God will bless you if you don't give up when your faith is being tested. He will reward you with a glorious life just as he rewards everyone who loves him. Now, all of those of you that, are ever, that have ever been disappointed or have ever found yourself in a place where that you were questioning, did you ever stop wanting him to be God? I didn't. I questioned where he was. I questioned if he was real, but I always wanted him to be, and I always loved him. In faith, I loved him. Am I talking to anybody? So the scripture says to those of you who have had those questions, but yet in your heart you've always tried to believe, you've always wanted to believe, you've always loved him in hopes that that love was real, that he was real, but it was always, in you it was always, the scripture says, 
He will reward you with a glorious life just as he rewards everyone who loves him. Regardless of how you feel, what you said today, how you think, what was your latest test? So there it is. I mean, I want you to hear this statement. Your faith being tested does not mean you are failing. Did you hear that? In fact, your faith will always be tested at times. And guess who it is that will be behind that testing? The one who knows you need to be strengthened in your faith. The one who loves you, the one who is for you, the one who exists, the one who still does everything he said he can do. That one is the one who will test you. Why would he test me, pastor? Because he wants your faith to be stronger. He will test you. So it doesn't mean that when you're being tested, you're failing. It means when you're being tested, you're loved. It's powerful. So God is going to allow the testing of your faith. Is your faith being tested right now? Have you gone from shouting to crying? In fact, I I ask this question. There's some of you that are hearing this right now from wherever you might be that have gone from from, uh, successful ministry, whatever that might have been. I'm not talking about pastoral, but I'm talking about have gone from, from successful, fulfilled, public ministry, maybe at your job or or in your home, or wherever it might have been, you've gone from successful ministry to sitting alone in a dark place. If you've ever done that, this is you in this story. Who at one time, you're saying, man, I was doing this ministry, and it was doing well, and it was successful, and I was having the opportunity to minister to people, I was seeing good things happen. Now all I do is just sit. In this dark place, I have no influence. I have, nobody's talking. Nobody's asking me. Nobody's using me. Nobody. I'm just. I used to refer to that as sitting in the stairwell. I've been in ministry before where I sat in the stairwell. I'm in a group with a bunch of other pastors, and we visit. And I, I used that statement one day, and it was several months ago when I told them what that meant. And one of the guys brought that up. It had been several months since we talked about it. One of the guys brought it up in our last meeting. He said, "Man." Been, any of you guys been sitting in the stairwell? He remembered me talking about that. Because sitting in the stairwell is, is when you just get tired and you get hurt and you get discouraged and you find a stairwell somewhere and you sit there with the door shut in the dark wait for people to go home. I used to do it at a church I was at. I would sit in the stairwell with the door shut and the lights off, and I'd hear people running up and down the hallway hollering, is he here? Have you seen him? I need to talk to him. I knew there was a line forming out there. They wanted something from me, and I was just so tired. I was just done with them. I mean, I loved them, but I was just done. And I would say, dear God, why don't they go home? I've been sitting here for 15 minutes in the dark stairwell. Go home! Like, have you ever gotten like that? Am I the only one? Like, call me tomorrow. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm done. I just sit there in the dark. I'm just sitting there like, oh, my land. And I could hear him running back and forth. I hadn't found him yet. If you found him, you see him. Nope, I'll find him in a minute. I'll tell you you what I find out. I'll tell you where he's at. God, golly, you're not going to find me. I mean, this is a good spot. I've been hiding here for a long time. You're not going to find me. (laughs) Go home. Go home so I can lock up. Come on, I'm being honest with you. I'm being honest with you. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? You say, well, yeah, I was in my own house and I mute the TV when it, and I turn off my phone and I turn off the lights and, and I wait for them to leave the door. You say, Pastor, that sounds like you know how to do that. Yeah, I've done that lots of times. They, they're at the door and I just, I'm like, well, I don't think they heard the TV, so you mute it and then you kick off your sandals because they make noise and then you Slip off into the bedroom and wait for them to leave and watch out the window until their car drives away. You're like, that's not very nice. I'm not coming to your house anymore. And I'll be like, well, you might be the one I was hiding from. (laughs) 
I'm just being honest. I'm not there now. I thank God that, was, that, that wasn't even here when that happened. But it happened. And there have been a lot of occasions since then where that I didn't physically sit in the stairwell, but I've been there in my mind. I've been there in my soul. I've been in places. I've never been in the prison like John, but I've been in the pla- places where that it got real dark and it got real quiet. I wasn't hearing much from the Lord. I got real discouraged, got depressed. I think I even got to, I think I've even been depressed. I don't know nobody diagnosed me, but I think I was. And during those times, you can find yourself saying, God, I don't know why I'm not hearing from you. I feel like I just pray and it is, I've heard, I used to hear the old timers talking about that. I pray and it just like it hits the bottom of brass clouds. Huh? Anybody? Am I talking to anybody? This was John the Baptist. This was John. If you're sitting in the stairwell right now in your life, if you find yourself sitting in a dark place, If you find yourself thinking, I don't know if this is ever going to get better. I don't know if God's hearing my prayers. I don't know if this is ever going to change. I don't know if I'm going to die like this. I don't know. I don't know. If you find yourself in, in that place, then this word is for you. And here it is. And this is the conclusion. The three things that Jesus said to John are the three things this living word, being Jesus, is saying to you. Number one, he is still God, if you're asking. He is still God. Just look at the proof all around you. And you say, yes, I know. I acknowledge that because I am seeing that. Number two, don't let this situation trip you up. Pastor, I'm really struggling with that. I feel like I've already fallen. I'm already on my knees. Don't let this situation trip you up to the point of discouragement and quitting. My pastor Don Hutchings always used to say, and I loved it when I was at Evangel Temple. He used to say, you can't lose if you just won't quit. You can't lose if you just won't quit. I love that. And number three, remember, this is big, write it down. You are still the best in his eyes. And he loves you and he's proud of you even when you're in these places. I want you to remember something else. And I want you to take this as as I feel a promise. God is going to bless you again. This dark place that you're in is not permanent. Don't give up. He said that he is going to reward you with glorious blessings just as he rewards everyone who loves him. That's me quoting scripture. Just as he rewards everyone who loves him. Pastor, I'm struggling, but I still love him. I can go back in all of my dark seasons, all my struggles, all my stressful situations, and I realize as I think back through them that I never stopped loving him. I I wondered sometimes if he knew where I was. I wondered if he was going to listen to my prayer. I wondered if he was ever going to come to my rescue again. But I never stopped loving him. I never once stopped wanting him to be who he said he was. That never changed. Um, And he has always come to my rescue as a result. And he's always rewarded me in spite of my shortcomings. And he's always blessed me even though uh, I was struggling. It's the same with you. You know the things I'm saying. You just need to be reminded, as John was reminded by Jesus that day, when he said, Jesus, are you the one? Yes. And you know it deep in your heart. You know it. You know it. You know the answer. You don't like the place you're in. I say be encouraged. You're like, all right, I receive it. I want to be. I'm ready to be encouraged. I want to pray for you.
it's a, it's a difficult thing to acknowledge when a word is for you. I understand that. But I feel like that there are people watching us right now that in their living rooms or in their bedroom or in their kitchen or maybe at a restaurant, I don't know, a coffee shop, wherever they're at, maybe in another place around the world, right now. Guys, I, I have a feeling that there's people like that right now that are sitting somewhere with tears running down their cheeks thinking, what's going on with me? Why am, why am I doing this right here? This is a universal word to the church. This one translates and needs to happen worldwide. People need to know, and I know that it's difficult, but I'm asking if that's you. You don't have to be in this room with us. Right there where you are, you're just acknowledging and saying, this is my word, and let the Holy Spirit do a work in you. I'm going to pray for you. And for those of you that are in the room right now, you don't have to come down to the front. You don't even have to stand up. I'm not trying to embarrass you or let everybody know that you're the one that's having this, the difficult time. But I do want to pray for you. And so I'm, I'm just, I don't even need you to raise your hand. I don't need that. I'm not going to go out later and write down 15 people raised their hand when I gave an altar call. I don't, I don't need to know that. I just want for you to receive this word and to receive this prayer and to be encouraged today. I'm not going to need you to raise your hand. I, I'm going to get to see the fruit. I'm going to get to see the fruit of your life as you exit this dark place. That's all the proof I'm going to need. I'm going to see a transformation in the way you're living your life and the joy that has come back into your soul. So if that's if this is your word today, you don't have to acknowledge to me in any way, but in right there where you're at, acknowledge in your spirit. Just say to the Holy Spirit right now, this is my word. This is for me. And God, I'm going to receive this prayer. And I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord, it's your, this is your word. John the Baptist was the one that you sent. He was the forerunner. This was an important ministry. And yet he struggled just like all of us. And when he did, you weren't angry. You didn't throw him out. You didn't cast him aside. Instead, Lord, you just encouraged him. You, you, were, you were okay with his faith being tested. It just simply, in the end, strengthened it even more. God, you're not afraid of our questions. You're not afraid of our confusion. You're not afraid of the times when we doubt. Lord, what a powerful word today to remind us of your love and your care, your patience. Lord, your endurance. I thank you for what you said to John and you say to us today when we ask that question. You say, oh yeah, I am who I said I am. All you got to do is look at the miracles around you. Yes, I am. Don't trip up, but be encouraged because I think you're the best. I love you. I'm for you. And I'm going to bring you through this. Thank you, Lord, for that confirmation. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for healing. Thank you for rest and peace that is coming to people right now. Thank you for bringing us out of a dark place. I understand dark places. And I'm so grateful today. So grateful today for your word. God, in faith we cling to. And we come through those moments. God, it's through those times we come through we have the greatest testimonies. the most to show for our lives. Nothing ever great came from easy.
greatness comes through adversity. There's no victories without battles. And faith is weak when it's not stretched. Encourage us right now, I pray, Lord, wherever we might be, whether we're in Fayetteville, Arkansas, or if we're somewhere else around the world right now, wherever we might be, I pray, oh God, that you would see the sincerity of our hearts, that you would see the brokenness in our spirit, that you would see that in spite of our questions, in spite of our doubt, there is still a very deep-seated hope that you are. There is a love no matter what. And God, you're going to bless those who love you. I pray in Jesus' name right now that you would begin to turn those things around in our life. I don't know how long the seasons are to last. You're the only one that knows what you're doing and how long it'll be, but God, you're the one who encourages us. And I pray for that encouragement today in the name of Jesus. All praise and glory and honor goes to you. I love you, Lord. I'm so grateful to you. I'm so proud of you. Now, right now, I pray, touch these who are discouraged, these who are questioning. Let their faith begin to well up in them. Let this word take root in their heart. Let them just grow stronger and stronger and give them a great testimony as a result of this season. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hey, thanks again for stopping by our YouTube channel. Go ahead and subscribe right now so that you don't miss any of our sermons or any of our online content. And if you want to know more about Trinity Fellowship and everything that we have to offer, then go to our website at trinitynwa.com or hit us up on any one of our social media platforms at Trinity NWA. We hope to see you here soon.